make sure that it's working. Okay. Says we're live. So far, everything looks good. You want to say hello? Hello. Hello. All right. I wonder if we're going to have Tyler come join us. I shouldn't. I, I haven't talked He's to them. He's doing a good job with those slides. Yes. We were just talking, for those of you who are joining in, we were just talking about what we're going to do next. And I don't, I remember before we started Acts, a few of us were talking and we wanted to do Romans and we wanted to do the book of Revelation. And I think that will work fine unless anyone's really changed their minds and doesn't want to do one of those two things. Or if you discovered an interest in some other book of the Bible that we could do instead I'd be happy to consider that but I think that's the plan okay. we can finish Acts and then we can do Romans those th those complement each other because oh good because Paul wrote Romans and Acts tells us the life story of Paul in sort of a dramatic way uh, narrates his journeys and the book of Romans really written late in Paul's life Okay. And it's in a way Paul kind of summing up everything that he knows, saying, "Here's I'm at the end of my life, and he was he was about to be he was killed in Rome, uh -huh. and he's saying, here I am at the end of my life, and he's writing this letter, and he really lays out the big picture of what he what he believes and why he believes it, and so that will be a nice way to end our study of Acts is to go to Paul and hear Paul kind of and it's very theological I'll warn you it's it's theology it's these it's abstract it's intellectual and it's challenging uh -huh. so but I know you guys are up for it I know that you can handle it okay. but it's not as story as Acts is okay. so there's not as many stories it's really in your in your head concepts trying to wrap your mind around who God is and what it means that Jesus died for us uh -huh. so that that'll be the plan um, I see that Robin is with us and Linda and Jim are to see you hello we've got a good group getting getting started here we're in chapter 21 of the book of Acts so if you get your Bibles ready turn to chapter 21 and we'll start in just one minute, I think. Give other people a chance to tune in online or maybe if someone shows up. I think Rodney's out of town, oh. but he sometimes joins us online when he's out of town even. Okay. So hopefully he can be with us. Hmm. So everyone's doing well? Yeah. I do have some news that you should know about maybe before we start. And that is, I heard today that Bruce Freeman, who lives at Streamside, he oh. has been diagnosed with COVID. He with tested. It? Oh, really? Yeah, he tested positive. So that's something we should be praying for. He has a lot of risk factors. His lungs aren't great to begin with. He, you've seen him on oxygen before. So yeah. pray for Bruce. I know he'd want everyone to pray for him. So he's at St. Luke's, I think. But obviously no one can visit him. So... But you can pray. Oh gosh! Did we get this over with? You know, the the virus and everything. It's it's really terrible. It is terrible. I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. Unfortunately, no, that's for sure. No, I don't know, someone. I don't know if someone's coming there. But I think maybe we can get started. Okay. Okay. Well, let's be. If you tune in, say hello. Um, and put your comments and put your questions in the comment box and I will respond as best I can and try to answer your, the questions that you might have and obviously you folks who are here should just speak up. Okay. 
After we had, this is chapter 21, verse 1 of the book of Acts. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to coast. We went to Rhodes and from there to Patara. These are all cities, again, near Asia Minor. You, some of you have heard of Rhodes. It's where there was a famous statue, the Colossus of Rhodes. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So it was a large port city with a lot of commerce. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre. So now they're heading east through the Mediterranean Sea, passing Cyprus on the south. Cyprus is an island just west of Israel. And they land at Tyre, which is to the north of Israel. Verse 4. Are you looking for your map? or? I get fun. Okay. Yeah. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We're talking in the first person plural again, so that means that Luke, the author, is with Paul on this journey. Uh -huh. They're heading back to Jerusalem, and those who they meet with say, don't go, don't do it. Why do you suppose that is? Because they're, they're ready to get them. Yeah. To kill them. Gotcha. Yes. The, the trip back there is a dangerous one. Dangerous for several reasons. At this point, the the Jewish people now are not only angry with Paul because he's proclaiming Jesus, but he's also created kind of a related scandal by bringing Gentiles into the church and saying that the law is no longer really necessary, that the ritual observances of the law aren't necessary, at least for at least for Gentiles. I think Paul, as a Jew, probably kept the law himself and thought it was okay and fine for people who were Jews to keep the Jewish law and observe all those ritual observances. certainly did. I mean, all the disciples did. Even Jesus himself did. So did James. But Paul's bringing these Gentiles in, and by telling the Gentiles, oh, you know what, you don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to follow all these ritual laws. The, the more legalistic Jews really took offense at that because they saw it as denigrating the importance of the law. And so now they're angry with Paul reasons. <laughs> and so they're saying, look, don't go back there. You're going to you're going to get killed. Now, verse 7. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais. Now let's see who's joining us. So, oh, Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi, Linda Smalley. Hi, Rodney Moore. He's joining us from the mountains. Oh. Juliana. Hi, Juliana. Good to see you. So we're at Acts chapter 21, verse 7. We can, And we're traveling with Paul back to Jerusalem. Dangerous, And some people are saying, Paul, you shouldn't go. You're going to get killed. We continue our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemais, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven, and married daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So they stay with this man, his daughters are virgins, they prophesy. That's a fulfillment of prophecy, right? I think it's Joel. The prophet Joel talks about your young men will dream dreams and your young women will speak prophecies. So Acts is kind of telling us that a lot of these... A lot of these Old Testament prophecies are being fulfilled in the coming of Jesus and in the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then another prophet comes. This prophet's name is Agabus. Coming over to us, <clears throat> he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way, the Jews of Jerusalem are the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So he kind of acts, acts out his prophecy. If you've read some of the Old Testament prophets, like Ezekiel and Isaiah, for instance, and even Jeremiah, sometimes they act out 
some strange things to illustrate their point. Uh, for example, what is I think it's Ezekiel who lays on his side for like I don't remember 120 days, and might be Isaiah goes around naked. Oh my! I mean, so the prophets were there was a tradition of prophets doing. They did this for attention, right? I mean, and then ta oh here, I mean the obvious. I'm forgetting the most obvious example. Um, think about Hosea, who we, we read. I don't know if you guys were here, but Hosea goes out and marries a prostitute. And the, the point there is to illustrate that Israel, the people, are prostituting themselves by worshiping God. And my point is just there's this tradition of doing acting out in dramatic ways the content of their message. And so in this way, Agabus is really acting like a lot of the Old Testament prophets do. He takes Paul's belt, he ties it around him. In dramatic fashion, here's what's going to happen to you if you go to Jerusalem. Now, verse 12. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. That's the second time we've heard that. This is the second group of people that have tried to, they're trying to dissuade Paul. They're trying to stop him. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the home of Manasson, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. So I wanted to share with you something here. Paul shows this eagerness, right? He, he says, I'm ready to go to Jerusalem and I'm ready to die. He's ready to die. And it, there's almost an eagerness that it's almost like Paul um, wants to die. Why do you think, I mean, think about it. why would, why would Paul be eager to die or want to be martyred? For some reason, it's a major goal to him. Mm -hmm. It's what he feels has to happen and he's tired of, you know, he wants to get there. Yeah. Be realize whatever it is he's imagining is the Lord will be done. Why would why would he want to die? Why would he be or, or at least be ready to be killed? Well he he believes. He has faith that he will be he will see Jesus. So that's part of it. He he believes that when he dies Yeah. Yeah he writes that so it's not a why else would he want to be martyred? There's there's two other big reasons that I really want you to get, and that I and that I, I think you should you should know and think about. One of the things is what is the what was the effect of martyrdom in the early church? It certainly pushed people to believing. Yeah, that's it. That's a that's the big one. That's the one. That's the one I was hoping you would get. Is that when Christians died publicly for their faith, it provided a witness. It showed the world what they believed in. How did Paul become a Christian? I mean, in part, it was because he saw Stephen be martyred. I've said this over and over again, but I'm going to repeat it. That is how the church spread. That's how Christianity spread, is because people took notice of the people who were dying for what they believed in. Does that make sense? Yes. If, if well, it's, it, for us, it's hard to believe, but yeah, they're back when they, they did it. Yeah. Why is it hard to believe for us? What do you mean? If people today were willing to die for what they believed in, would it not get our attention? Yes, but... Well, they were beheaded, a bunch of them over here by the... And I... Wherever. <laughs> you know, 
of them. And, I mean, we know. Oh, there are Christians are, being martyred. There on. are Christians being martyred today, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I guess Martin Luther King and some of those. Martin Luther King, yeah, he was, and he talked this way too. Notice that Martin Luther King spoke this way years before he died. He he had been given death death threats over and over again. Uh-huh. His house had been air bombed. Yeah. I think several attempts had been made on his life, and so King knew that dying for what he believed in was a strong possibility for him, and he was willing to embrace it. And in a sense, I mean, that, what does martyrdom mean? That word martyr, do you know what it means? It means witness. Witness. So that, that, I'm driving this point home. One of the reasons Paul wants to die is because it will make a point. <laughs> it will make known through his death, people will see and hear and understand what he believes in and how much he believes in it martyrdom is a witness um so that's that's and then there's a third thing that is a little there's a third reason paul would want to die and it's a little more subtle um can any of you think what it would be who does paul follow Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is Paul's leader and rabbi. Yeah. So when you follow someone, you follow them. Think about what that word means. Where did Jesus go? I mean, in his to, to die. Die. So by dying, Paul is being like his teacher. Paul is dying like his master died, and he wants to be. He wants to be like his rabbi. He wants to be like his Lord. So there's three reasons that Paul is ready to die. And Carla brought up the first. One is that he knows he'll be with Jesus. Two is that it will make a point. It will make known what he believes. And third, it will be a way of him sharing, being like his master. And I, I wanted to share with you, this is a, from a letter... Ignatius of Antioch was an early Christian father living in the second century, so 100 years after Jesus, maybe a little less. And Antioch, Ignatius of Antioch is on his way to Rome where he's going to be put on trial. And he'll be killed by the Romans. He'll be executed. Rome had, at this time had begun to persecute Christians. And he writes this letter to the church at Rome. And the contents of this letter to the Romans by Ignatius is basically arguing the same the same thing that Paul is arguing let me die don't get in my way don't try to stop me don't try to prevent it let me be killed and he says this he said that I may not merely be called the name of Christian but really be found to be one right he wants to live out his faith he wants to give everything for his faith to prove that he is not just a Christian in name only, but he truly lives it out. Then he goes on, Allow me to obtain pure light. When I have gone there, I shall indeed be a man of God, so she, he, he, who will become a full human being created in the image of God, because he'll be like Christ when he gives his life. He talks about his martyrdom as a sacrifice, a, a gift to God. Then he says, and he, this gets into our third reason, I shall indeed be a man of God. Permit me to be an imitator of the passion of my God. Let me be like Jesus. Let me die like he died. So anyway, I, I wanted, uh, that's a pretty powerful example of why someone, and many Christians did this. It wasn't just a few, but hundreds, maybe thousands of Christians went to their death and they did it for those three reasons. They had hope. They knew they would be with Jesus. They wanted to make a witness to show the world what they believed. And third, they wanted to be like Jesus. They wanted to share uh-huh. in his passion, share in his suffering. So that's what Paul's talking about here. Um, let's see. Oh, Linda says we're experiencing interruptions. No, I hope not. 
Linda says hello. Robert, hello, Robert. Robert's saying Romans 13. Um, tell me, tell us why you're talking about Romans 13. Does that, that's a big chapter, a lot going on there. Are you thinking of that in, in relationship to martyrdom? Um, if so, yeah, maybe explain that a little bit more. But yeah, there's certainly lots of connections between the book of Acts and the book of Romans, like we said. Okay, verse 17, chapter 21, verse 17. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. We know who James is, yeah. the brother of Jesus, mm -hmm. sort of the leader of the church. And he really, once Peter dies, James becomes the leader in the church in Jerusalem. And we have a letter from James in the New Testament, too, and, for, and from Peter. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. They said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made about... Okay, I'm going to stop. You've already seen what I said, right? The, the news has spread that Paul's denigrating the law. Yeah. Now, that's not entirely true. Paul isn't saying that Jews shouldn't keep the law. He's saying that Gentiles don't need to. Gentiles should not be required to keep the law. That's different from saying that the law is bad, right? And that pe you know how people are. They take what you say and they exaggerate it to make you look bad. So that's what they've done with Paul. What Paul has said is that Gentiles don't need to keep the law to be saved. And they've, mischar they've caricatured, exaggerated Paul to telling people that the law of Moses is, doesn't matter, right? Okay. Four men they're going to take a vow. This is probably a Nazarite vow, and that was an, a Jewish custom. And in a Nazarite vow, you would give up meat and you'd give up red wine. You wouldn't shave or cut your hair for 30 days. At the end of that 30 days, you'd bring a bunch of offerings. I think a ram, a lamb, some bread, some oil, and you'd make that offering in the temple. So it's a 30 day vow, and it would often be done to say thank you. Sometimes, if something really good happened in your life, you would take a Nazarite vow and you'd do this for 30 days to show your gratitude. And anyway, Paul, these four men are going to take this vow and they ask Paul to do it to kind of show that Paul does respect the law, which he does. And he takes the vow. So it's to take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. I think for the last week they just had to hang out at the temple so they couldn't work, so they needed supplemental income or something then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law which is true paul did keep the law you know unless i mean there might have been some exceptions like there was with peter remember when peter ate with the centurion and he ate the foods that were unclean yeah. but he did that in order to share the gospel with them uh -huh. but generally both peter and paul would have observed all the law because they were jews as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. That was the compromise, remember? Gentiles could come into the church. They don't have to be circumcised. They don't have to keep all the dietary and food laws. But they do have to keep these four things. Don't eat food sacrifice to idols. Don't eat blood. Don't eat the meat of strangled animals. And abstain from sexual morality. Four four elements of the law that Gentiles do have to observe, but the rest of it, they don't. And I want to make another point here, and this gets confusing, or people do get confused. Um, the, the law, when Paul talks about it, refers to the ritual law, not the moral law. Right? Paul is not saying it doesn't matter if you kill or lie or steal or whatever. That's when Paul says you don't you don't need to observe the law, he isn't talking about those moral commands. Or even 
like the need to give to the poor or to take care of the needy. He's not saying that those things are unnecessary, even for Gentiles. Gentiles have to do good. They have to live compassionately, mercifully. Paul's not saying you don't have to do anything. He's saying that these ritual observances of the law are not necessary. So, and that, Paul doesn't make that super clear, partly because I think he just assumed that everyone would know that, of course, he doesn't mean that you don't have to be a good person. So he's talking about the law, the ritual side of the law. Is that, you, you look like you have a question. Do it again, just so... When Paul says, yeah. in, for instance, in his letters, that Gentiles don't have to keep the law, he isn't talking about the moral law. Okay, the moral, okay. He's talking about the ritual law. Okay. Do you understand the difference? Yeah. What, what would be a moral law? Well, not, uh, not talking... Uh, not lying. Yeah, yeah. Not gossiping. Yeah. Or, or even something positive, like uh, you take care of the needy, take yeah. care of the poor. Yeah. So that would be the moral law. Yeah. You still have to do that. You still have to live that yeah. way. A ritual law would be circumcision. Yeah. Not eating pork. Yeah. Uh, or not eating meat mixed with dairy, for instance. Yeah. So, but just to make that clear, oh, Robert, so Robert's saying, then they wouldn't be following Romans... 13, and the preacher would tell them they're going against the Father because they're not doing... Yeah, I'm not really sure what you're getting at there. Um, but let's keep reading. Um, verse 13. Oh, no. Um, we're, be, we're beyond that. We are at verse 26. 26. The next day Paul took the men and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. So he's going to take, Paul's willing to do this. Paul probably didn't think it was necessary, but this shows us what kind of a diplomat Paul was, that he's willing to compromise. He says, I will do this. I will show that I respect the law by taking this vow and supporting these four men. So he's conceding and showing that he does care about the law. Even though the accusations are baseless, mm -hmm. even though they are untrue, he is going to do this public act to show that he reveres the law. Mm -hmm. And as a Jew himself, is willing to keep it. Now, verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple area and defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. So Paul had come with an entourage of some Greek Gentile, non-Jewish converts to Christianity, brought them with him to Jerusalem. They'd seen him walking with them in the city, and they make the accusation that he's brought those Gentiles into the temple, which was illegal and was punishable by death. Uh -huh. the, the temple, as we've talked about before, several layers. The, yeah. Outer, yeah. Okay. the outermost layer was for the Gentiles, Inner that is the the court of women, and only. What's your no, question? No. The, the, the one inside, the one draped. Well, that's the holy of holies. But yeah. but even before we get to that, there was a there were places where Gentiles could come around the temple. Then inside of that, there was a place for women, and that was the furthest women could go. Jewish women could come into the court of women. But Gentiles couldn't. And there was a sign in between those two saying, if you're a Gentile, if you're not a Jew, and you come through here, you'll be killed. And even the Romans respected that. Roman respected that law. Romans wouldn't go in there. And Romans allowed the Jews to carry out the death penalty for Gentiles that crossed that boundary. And then, then there's the holy place, which only men could go in. Inside of that, 
was a tabernacle where actually no one could go yeah. into but the priest and then only you know once a year or whatever so there's several layers of the temple and that the accusation here is that Paul's brought a Gentile in the past through the court of the women which is punishable by death the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions of course it's false Paul Paul was a friend of this person and was with this person but didn't bring him into the temple the whole city was aroused and the people came running from all directions seizing Paul they dragged him from the temple and immediately the gates were shut while they were trying to kill him news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar he at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd when the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers they stopped beating Paul now here the Roman government is really the, the Roman laws were strict but relatively objective <laughs> so the Romans just wanted to keep the peace and the Romans were not tolerant of mobs or of rioting or of illegal you know unsanctioned violence so the, the main role of the Romans here is just to keep the peace and so it's actually the Roman overlords that save Paul's life here in this instance because the soldiers stop them from essentially lynching Paul so he the the commander and there was a right across from the temple there was a Roman kind of castle where some up to a thousand Roman troops were stationed because Jerusalem had a lot of problems uh -huh. Jerusalem had a lot of riots <laughs> the, the, yeah the, the Israelites had lots of rebellions and things like that and so um, yeah to some extent um, to some extent the Romans have good reason for having troops stationed there oh no it says sorry we're having trouble playing this video again I'm sorry I don't know why we're having these problems um, so Paul is going to be arrested but it's really for his protection so the commander came up arrested him ordered him to be bound with two chains and he asked who he was and what he had done some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another and since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks when Paul reached the steps the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers the crowd that followed kept shouting so the Roman soldier, the, the lead Roman guard, is just trying to figure out, you know, let's get to the bottom of this. Just the facts, folks. But everybody's shouting, and he can't figure it out. So he just takes him into custody, and where he'll be safe. Uh, now Paul has a conversation with the Roman centurion. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, May I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? He replied. Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago? Now, that, this, that's, we're not sure exactly who that was. There's some reports of this in the ancient histories. But as I said before, this sort of thing happened pretty often in Jerusalem because people don't like to be ruled. <laughs> the Romans, the, yeah, I mean, they're, they're Israelites. They want to rule, you know, the same reason we had a revolution, right? The Romans were like the British, right? And the Israelites wanted wanted the Romans out. So they kept leading these revolts. And the guard think, Are, aren't you this guy who led this revolt a while back? Uh, and Paul says, no. He answered, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. Having received the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the crowd. So once the commander sees first that Paul's not this Egyptian revolutionary from whatever happened before, and once he sees that Paul's an educated man, that he can speak Greek is a big deal, right? That shows that Paul is, is not just some common uh, ruffian, yeah. but that he's an educated person. The commander says, okay, you can speak. Here's what Paul says. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, 
I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you perse persecute me? So first, Paul, just like you, I've kept the law, I've studied the law as well as any of you, but then this happened to me. Then he tells his, this is his conversion story. This is his testimony. Yeah. I saw Jesus. So who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. So he, he's telling his conversion story. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law. This is, the, I think, the second or third time, by the way, Paul's told this story in the book of Acts. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. And Ananias, by the way, if you remember the first, Ananias was also a Christian. Paul's really highlighting here that Christians aren't against the law. Right? He emphasized that Ananias is So he's saying, look, and this is Jesus, Peter, James, they were all devout Jews who kept the law. No one is saying the law is bad, right? Just that it's not necessary. Uh, verse 13, stood beside me, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. What are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So first, and this is sort of the steps that every Christian goes through, right? First you repent, you're sorry for your sins, you have an encounter with Christ, and then you're called. You're given a purpose and a mission in life, and then you're baptized, and you enter the church. And so this is, in a way, yes, Paul's story may be more dramatic than some of ours. Mm -hmm. We didn't, weren't knocked off our horse and see a vision. But in, another, but in the broad sense, the basic series, the steps, one, two, and three, it's really the same for every Christian. And we've all been through these steps had to let go of, and we still probably do have to repent, most of us anyway. You let go of your sinful ways, you have ex an experience with Christ, you, and you're given a calling, you're given a purpose. So, um, here we go. At Paul is finishing his story. Um, verse 17. When I returned to Jerusalem, was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Okay, that's Paul's story. Any questions or comments there? Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to understand what Robert's asking. I'm still confused. Um, yeah, I don't think that this really is about the government at all. Um, it's about Jesus and about telling people the good news of what Jesus has done. Um, 
the government really isn't central to the story at all and isn't really that important, I don't think, to the Christian life. Um, we can live faithfully with the government. Um, so, now, verse 22, I think we could finish chapter 22 if we move quickly. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, Is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? he asked. This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen. And here, the, the Romans become a help to Paul because they were at least a nation of laws and they believe in law and order so they can't you can't arrest or beat a roman citizen now the next day this is verse 30 since the commander wanted to find out exactly why paul was being accused by the jews he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the sanhedrin to assemble then he brought paul and had him stand before them commander you can imagine let's just get to the bottom of this what's going on here because really all the commander cares about is that there's peace he doesn't care you know from his from the perspective of roman government doesn't care one way or another 